All right, Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 this morning. We're just going to narrow in on that one verse today, uh, the first verse, which is the call of the, uh, the call of Abraham by the Lord. And this will give us an opportunity to really focus in on Abraham, the man, for a little bit. We've talked a lot about uh, the Abrahamic covenant uh, last week in the introduction, and we'll continue to do so because, as I mentioned last week, it's a, it's a significant foundational covenant for really the rest of redemptive history and the rest of scripture. Um, but we really want to focus in on Abraham, the man today, and particularly on his call. So uh, Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. So this call of the Lord really launches everything. And what we want to do for a little bit at the beginning here is just talk about why, why Abraham is so significant and important. Again, he's important because of the covenant God is going to make with him. And we'll begin to see that in the subsequent verses. We're going to see the promises given. And then we're going to see the unfolding of the covenant for, you know, all through the next several chapters like we talked about last week. Um, so that's obviously very significant. But why what is so significant about Abraham himself? I mean, if you just think about it, I've alluded to this a couple of times um, already in this series. <clears throat> We've got, you know, you really could divide the book of Genesis into thirds. The first third, the first 11 chapters occupies three millennia. It occupies the entire span of time from the creation of all things all the way through, you know, Cain and Abel, and through Noah and the Ark, which occupies a lot of uh, material in that section. And then, of course, the Tower of Babel, all the way up to Abraham. So the first 11 chapters is three millennia, covers a lot of a lot of territory. The second third of the book of Genesis is largely focused on this one man. So we've got three millennia, and then a very short span of time to really focus attention on Abraham. And then, of course, then extended to Isaac and Jacob, and then... Uh, the last third is largely focused on the the um, on Joseph and the time in in Egypt and the ex and leading up to the Exodus. So just by virtue of the time spent in the book of Genesis, we can see that obviously God holds Abraham as a significant figure. And so we want to spend a little time asking the question: Why? Why is Abraham so important? What is so significant about Abraham? that he would get this much attention in the book of Genesis, which is not a short book, right? But a whole third of the book is given over to this one man. So let me just throw that out there on the table and let's just discuss it for a little bit. And then I want to work through some, some specifics. So just throw out some ideas or some things that might come to your mind. Why, why is Abraham given so much attention here in the book of Genesis? Well, the purpose of the father of the sinful descendants of Israel and also the father Okay. Excellent. So this we'll we'll, we'll uh, go through this a little bit in a moment again, but this relates to everything we talked about last week. That you know Abraham is the father of everyone. He's the father, of, well, not everyone, but he's the father of, of of Jews physically, and then everyone who believes spiritually. And so he really is the fountainhead of again everything that we see happen in subsequent scripture because of the covenant that God makes with him. Good. Just like Noah had three sons, and we talked about the three sons. Abraham had three families. Okay. Each one of which carried on the line. Okay. One was Moab, Moab. So you, you can see the three different families coming out. Okay. So significant families come from Abraham, even just physically, which play a huge role to come. Yeah. Good. So that's significant. What else? Why is Abraham so important, so significant? Kind of a pivotal point of God's redemptive work. Okay. From you know going yeah. from uh, you know from Adam you have so much of dealing with the fall specifically and then with Abraham it's a pivot point God's redemptive plan. Good. Right. So salvation history really turns at this point and now there's a solution and God is is, is giving further revelation in the unfolding of how he is going to accomplish the promise that he gave all the way back in Genesis 3. Good. So we'll talk about that uh, in a moment here. Great. What else? What about Abraham? So these are all um, 
These are all about what come from Abraham, and they involve the Abrahamic covenant and the, the redemptive history that's going to come as a result of Abraham, all of which are absolutely true and important. But what about Abraham the man, right? So that's what we really want to focus on uh, here as well. Clearly, Abraham factors in the redemptive plan of God and the unfolding of God, God's covenant work, absolutely. But what about Abraham as an individual? Is there anything significant about Abraham as an individual that would warrant a whole third of the book of Genesis and a focus on him. Okay. So think about how the New Testament treats Abraham. The New Testament does talk about the, the key the key place that Abraham plays in redemptive history and the Abrahamic covenant and the, the two, you know, the two humanities that come from him and all of that. But it also uh, specifically focuses on Abraham as an example of faith, which is necessary for what? For justification, right? He is he is a key figure. So we'll talk about that as well. Good. Okay. So I think I think we've hit all the all the things that I want to work through. Let's begin with this, uh, and this this deals with this issue. I think that you know John brought up and that ties into the Abrahamic covenant, and that is that Abraham really is the climax of the line of the seed of the woman that we see developed in the first eleven chapters, right? So remember in uh, Genesis 3.15, in the midst of the curse upon the serpent, God gives this promise of the gospel, or as we talked about last week, and certainly will develop in the weeks to come, it's a promise of the covenant of redemption, the covenant, covenant of grace, uh, this, this unmerited favor that God will show to his people, not because they earn any sort of merit, because in Adam all have died, so we're all we're, we're all lost. We cannot earn favor with God of our own strength. And yet, in the promise of Genesis 3.15, God promises a an offspring, a seed, a humanity that would come from the woman through whom ultimately there will be a singular seed who will crush the serpent's head. But as we saw over and over again through the first 11 chapters of Genesis, Moses is is continually uh, narrowing in on uh, the representative examples of that line, right? First, Seth, the son of of Adam and Eve. So Cain wasn't that chosen line. Abel, you know, may have been that chosen line. You know, you don't want to deal with hypotheticals, but of course, he was killed. So who becomes the 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 seed of the woman that will uh, perpetuate the redemptive line? It's Seth, right? And then we see uh, a focus on Noah. Noah continues that line, obviously, because all other families of the earth are are, are uh, killed. And then we see the line continued through Shem. And then we saw at the end of chapter 11, uh, the line of Shem narrows to Terah. And then, of course, Terah is the father of Abraham. So every Moses is intentionally working down and showing us that it's all going to climax in the person of Abraham. And Moses does this in a significant way that we highlighted, if you remember, all the way back before our Advent series, the very last lesson at the end of chapter 11. We noticed that every significant genealogy in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, Moses includes 10 names in those genealogies. So each of these genealogies in which he's tracing the redemptive line from the seed of the woman, there are 10 names. But do you remember when we get to the end of chapter 11 and he gives us the genealogy of Terah, does he give us 10 names? Do you remember this? Probably don't. It was a while ago and this is you know, somewhat maybe uh, something that we don't often pay attention to. But he doesn't give us 10 names. He gives us eight names. Excellent. And so what is that in a sort of literary way of course, that's both the design of God, but also the the you know the inspiration of the Spirit and Moses's recording of these things. In a, in a literary way, what does that make us sort of feel? We've got ten names, and then ten names, and then ten names, and all these significant genealogies, and then now there's only eight. What does it make us sort of long for? Where where's where's the climax? Right? Where what's missing? And it's sort of making us long for or look forward to is sort of a, a literary marking and a historical marking that lets us recognize Abra, Abram, soon to be Abraham, is the climax of all of these genealogies. 
And it's two because of, of Abraham's two sons that we're going to see, which is tied into these, these two physical humanities that become very significant. So we have Ishmael, but then of course, Isaac being the, the, the chosen son. So all of this is leading us to anticipate the seed, to anticipate the climax of the redemptive line, the offspring of Eve, who will lead toward redemption, who will help to accomplish this promise of the covenant of grace. So that's one significant reason Abraham factors in so heavily in this book. Second, it's significant to recognize that, uh, that, that Yahweh, right, the true God, the one true and living God, becomes significantly identified with Abraham from this point forward. Think about it. From this point forward, almost every time Yahweh is alluded to or mentioned or referenced, he is often, he's most often referred to as, you know, Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Abraham right? Now, was he also the God of you know, of, 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 uh, of, of Shem. Yes. Was he the God of Noah? Yes. What he, was he the God of Seth? Yes. Was he the God of Adam? Yes. But from this point on, the true one, true and living God is, is very, very closely identified specifically with Abraham. And then of course the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. So often all three are listed, but if only one is listed, it's typically Abraham. He's the father of all. So, for example, just one, one example, when God reveals himself to Moses in the burning bush, and Moses says, who are you? And God reveals himself for the first time as Yahweh, right? Uh, which is, you know, which is the 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 third person version of, of I am, right? I am is the unique name of God. Yahweh simply means he is, right? So it's the, it's the reference to the unique name of God. And to clarify who this God is, what does God say to Moses in Exodus 3.15? God said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, because Moses says, you know, when the people ask, who, who is this God? What am I supposed to say? He says, say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, okay, so that's pretty generic in general, but specifically the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. So when he says, this is my name forever, and this is how I'm going to be remembered, he is specifically referring to that unique covenant name of Yahweh, but he's also including Yahweh, the God of Abraham the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. So from that point forward and forevermore, we see this in the New Testament, we see it all the way in the book of Revelation, right? Forevermore, God is going to be very, very closely identified with this man, Abraham. A third sort of significance of Abraham uh, that is not unique to him, but is it is uh, characteristic only of a few individuals of scripture in, in scripture is that Abraham is specifically identified in the Bible as a friend of God. That's a, a that's a really, you know, significant identification, right? Wouldn't we all want to be identified as a friend of God? And Abraham is specifically in several cases identified that way. Um, for example, Isaiah chapter 41 verse 8 says, "But you Israel, my servant, Jacob whom I I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, right? That's that's key to, to refer to an individual in that close of a sort of connection and relationship to Yahweh. Second Chronicles 20, verse 7. Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? Right? It's almost, almost his last name, right? Which Abraham? Well, Abraham, the friend of God. I mean, that's how closely identified this man is in, a, in an intimate way with Abraham. And, and even in the New Testament, in James chapter 2, verse 23, scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. So that, that's significant, that he is called a friend of God. But that particular quote in James chapter 2 leads us really to maybe the most significant reason Abraham is so important, and is something that several alluded to a few moments ago, and that is how the New Testament 
treats Abraham, how the New Testament authors use Abraham in, in very significant ways that have direct relevance, not just for the physical descendants of Abraham, the, the Shemites, the Jews, but for us who believe, for all who believe, we, even we Gentiles. So let's look at some of these key texts in the New Testament. I just read one there in James 2, where uh, Abraham is specifically called a friend of God, but it also helps us to see why Abraham was called a friend of God. Why was Abraham called a friend of God? Because Abraham believed and it was counted to him as righteousness. And this is one of the most significant ways that the New Testament treats the person of Abraham. Abraham becomes, in redemptive history, not just the father of the Jews, not just the sort of father of those who believe in a generic sense, but, but he is the father of those believed because he is the quintessential prime example of one who believed, one who exercised faith in the promises of God. And therefore, because of that, he was justified, or as James puts it here, it was counted to him as righteousness. So a key text, of course, for this is Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, which contrasts Abraham as the father of the physical flesh, right, the physical line of the Jews, with Abraham as the father of those who believe, not in a genetic hereditary sense, but in an exemplary sense, right? Romans chapter 4, verse 1, what then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh? Or if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. So what's Paul saying? He's saying that that fleshly lineage doesn't have any salvific value because even Abraham was not saved by any sort of physical works, right? Rather, how was Abraham justified? Verse 3, or what does the scripture say? And we're going to see this in the subsequent verses uh, here in Genesis. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Same language as James used that I read a moment ago. So Abraham becomes this primary example of justification through faith alone. The fruit of what was promised all the way back in Genesis 3.15, like we talked about last week. There's a promise of the gospel in Genesis 3.15. We're going to see next week there's a promise given specifically to Abraham that through him there's going to be salvation and blessing. But in the New Testament, we now see how that's fully fleshed out in the New Covenant, this, this, this means by which people come to uh, forgiveness of sin and salvation. And how does that happen? Well, we can look all the way back to the progenitor of it all, Abraham. Abraham believed, and that is why he was justified. Nothing physical, no works, no... Um, no physical lineage, which we'll talk about more in a moment. It's not that it's not that just because he came from Terah, who came from Shem, who came from Noah, etc., that Abraham was counted as righteous. No, it had nothing to do with lineage. It had everything to do with his faith, which we need to remind ourselves has always been the case, right? Was Abraham, or excuse me, was Adam justified by works? No. In fact, he was condemned because he failed to obey the commands of God. How was Adam justified? If we remember back in chapter 3, do you remember after God gives the curse and God gives the promise, Adam names his wife Eve, which means the mother of all, all living, right? Which we noted was very likely an expression of faith. That was his way of saying I believe that life is coming through my wife, right? So, so Adam was justified by faith. Eve, was Eve justified by works? No, she was justified by, by faith as well. We see this when she, when she bears her son, Seth, and says, I have uh, received a man from the Lord. That's an expression of faith in the promise that God had given in Genesis 3.15. We could go on and on, right? Was Noah justified by works? No, right? He was justified by faith confident belief we'll talk more about faith here in a moment in the promises of god was shem justified by works no 
was Abraham justified by works? No, these all were justified by faith. Abraham just becomes the quintessential example that is used in the New Testament. That the faith of others, as we've been studying in Hebrews chapter 11, is certainly emphasized in the New Testament. But Abraham is sort of um, raised up as a supreme example of those who uh, of one who believed and therefore it was counted to him as righteousness so that's obviously a significant way then that the new testament treats abraham which which raises him as a significant figure the new testament also makes a big deal of something that we've talked about already and that was mentioned here a moment ago um, and that is the idea that abraham is the father of both the circumcision the jews and those who believe uh, those who believe who are part of the uncircumcised, right? So a few verses later in Romans chapter 4, verse 11, Paul writes, he, that is Abraham, received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So what's the point? When was Abraham justified? Was he justified because he was circumcised? No, because he was justified before that, right? Circumcision was merely a seal and sign of something that had already taken place. And, and Paul continues, the purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised, right? Paul is specifically addressing the error in the thinking of some Jewish Christians that circumcision was a necessity. That, yeah, faith is important, but we have to be circumcised too. And, and, and Paul is saying, no, Abraham was justified before his circumcision so that even those who are uncircumcised, if they believe as Abraham believed, they also will be justified. And then, of course, his other point is even among those who are circumcised, is the circumcision what saves them? No. Now, can somebody who is circumcised be forgiven, be, be justified? Of course, but only if what? Only if they believe, right? So the condition is the same, whether you're circumcised or not. And Abraham is the father of both the circumcision. So that's just the physical line. Even unbelievers who are circumcised, he's the father of the Jews. But he is ultimately and most significantly the father of those who believe either circumcised or uncircumcised, right? Okay. And then, so that's Romans. Galatians also raises up Abraham as a significant figure. And we'll just read a couple of these texts, but they're emphasizing very similar ideas, both that Abraham is the, the, the representative example of one who believed and was accounted as righteous because of that, and as the father of both of these lines, father of the, of the circumcised and father of those who believe. So, for example, Galatians chapter 3, verse 7, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. So that's talking about the spiritual seed of Abraham. And we're going to see that promised in the, the next couple of verses in, in chapter 12 next week. Verse 8, and the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel. Notice this. This is, this is going to be very significant for next week. The scripture preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. We're going to see that very promise coming up in the next verses after God calls Abraham and Abraham commits to, or as part of the promise, Abraham commits to do that. We're going to see that promise of the gospel. A few verses later, Galatians 3.14, so that in Christ Jesus, now this is key, this will add to our understanding of how just well, the nature of justification in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So faith is that condition, but on what basis are we justified? We're justified, uh, the condition is faith, but we're justified because of what Jesus Christ did, right? And that, that again, has always been the case. Abraham, uh, excuse me, Adam was justified by faith in the promises of God on the basis of of the sacrifice that Jesus would accomplish on the cross. The same is true for Eve, the same is true for Seth and Noah and Shem and even Abraham and then all the Gentiles uh, as a result of this promise given in chapter 12. All are justified by faith because of the substitutionary work of atonement accomplished by the ultimate seed of the woman, the ultimate seed of Abraham on the cross. And then a few verses later then, sort of climaxing the discussion in Galatians chapter 3, verse 29, and if you are Christ's, 
then you are Abraham's offspring. Notice this language, because this is going to come up next week. Heirs according to promise. The Jews are heirs of Abraham according to circumcision, which we'll see in chapter 17. But believers, those who are in Christ, from Adam all the way up to us today, we are heirs according to promise. And the particular promise that it's referring to is exactly what we're seeing unfold here in chapter uh, 12 of Genesis. Okay, so Romans makes a big deal of Abraham, justified by faith. Galatians makes a big deal of Abraham as the father of those who are justified by faith. And then there's another significant passage in our New Testament, one that should come immediately to mind because we are studying it on Sunday nights. And that is what? Hebrews chapter 11, right? Uh, Hebrews chapter 11 in, in, uh, in two different places with a little interlude in between, the author of Hebrews makes a big deal about Abraham and his significance. And so let's, um, if you want to just turn there, I just want to read these texts and we'll, we'll reflect on them just for a few moments. Again, some of this is review and, and as what we're looking at in our Sunday evening series. But this also has significance for us. We'll see um, in, in a couple of ways we'll see in a moment. But Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, again, shouldn't surprise us, by faith, this is exactly what we're seeing now in chapter 12, Abraham obeyed when he was called, that's exactly what we just read in verse 1, to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. Notice this, because we're going to talk, we're going to un un sort of unpack the nature of saving faith here in a moment as we see it here in chapter 12, but that's exactly what Hebrews 11 is telling us. He went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. That's important. Why? For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. And then he even raises here in verse 11 the faith of Sarah, which we're going to see in the in the subsequent um, chapters as well. And then notice verse 12, therefore from one man, so it's related to the promise of Sarah that she would bear a, bear a son. Therefore from one man and him as good as dead, what's that referring to? How old they were, right? It should have been impossible that they were to have children. From one man and him as good as dead were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore, right? So again, faith, justified, justified by faith, faith in promises of God, which we're going to unpack here in a moment. And then what's the result? The result is the fulfillment of this promise that we're going to see given right here in chapter 12. And then a few verses later, uh, another instance of faith is mentioned. So up to this point, you know, the faith that is being referred to is largely connected to what happens here in chapter 12. God gives Abraham a command to leave his home and to go to another country. And what does Abraham do? He obeys out of faith, not because he has any sort of assurance, any sort of empirical evidence that he's going to be blessed. He simply goes by faith. But then in verse 17, we see the other significant um example of abraham's faith and that of course is when when, when he's called to sacrifice isaac right verse 17 by faith abraham when he was tested offered up isaac and he who had received the promise was an act of, of offering up his only son of whom it was said through isaac shall all shall your offspring be, be named he considered that god was able even to raise him from the dead from which figuratively, figuratively speaking he did receive him back, right? So Abraham exhibited a, a faith by which he was justified in obeying the call of God and going to the land of promise. But then he was also tested again later. And this has significant ramifications for the covenant that God makes with Abraham. When God says, kill your son. And this is the very son that God had said through whom would be blessing. And Isaac doesn't have any sons yet. So how's that going to happen? And yet Abraham still obeyed. And of course, will We'll be looking at that uh, that event as well. Okay, so Abraham is significant, right? He is, he is a turning point in redemptive history. 
He is the father really of two of, of, of the two humanities, the physical line of the Jews, as well as the line of all who believe, whether circumcised or uncircumcised. So if you're a Jew and you believe, like Abraham's your 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 double daddy, you know, he's your father twice, right? Um, but for we who are Gentiles, we are his children in terms of in a spiritual sense, because he is this quintessential example of justification by faith. So he's a significant figure uh, for, for all of those reasons. So now let's look specifically at this call itself. <clears throat> what, what is happening here in the call of God in verse 1 of chapter 12, which will lead, as we'll see next week, in this promise of the gospel that God will give to Abraham as a result of his obedience to the call. What is happening here? Because this is going to help us also to sort of unpack even further the nature of the faith that Abraham had, which is the same as the faith that is required for us to be justified. So uh, think about think about this first. Did Abraham <clears throat> seek out God? Was Abraham righteous in any sense to cause God then to say, oh, well, there's a there's a a good man who is doing his best to seek me out so i think i'm going to call him is that is that what happens here no the whole relationship between god and abraham which as we've seen is a significant uh, relationship a relationship of intimacy is called a friend of god and a relationship that results in the unfolding of god's plan of redemption that entire relationship between god and abraham begins with what God's initiation, God's call. That's how verse one begins. And remember, we talked about this in at the end of chapter 11, when um, just before the Advent series, uh, clearly Abraham and the entire family and his father were idolaters. They, they were worshiping false gods. We see this very clearly referred to in Joshua 24, verse two, when Joshua says to the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, long ago, your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, and they served other gods. So it's not even ambiguous. Like, you know, you can't even, you can't even say, well, maybe, maybe Terah or maybe Abraham was sort of searching for God and that's why God called him. No, Joshua explicitly says there in Joshua 24 that Terah and his sons were idolaters. And yet in the midst of that idolatry, when neither, when, when none of them were seeking out for God, God calls out Abraham. So why? Why did God call Abraham then? <clears throat> if it wasn't based on anything that he did or any goodness or any seeking after God, why did he call him? Glorify his own name? <clears throat> yep. Yeah, I mean, he, you know, he called him, you could put it this way. God called Abraham because he loved him. And why did God love Abraham? Simply because of his sovereign choice. Right? And if that, you know, if that makes us squirm at all, is that any different for us? Not at all. Right? We are, you know, Ephesians chapter 2. We are not saved by works. We are not saved because of any lovability in ourselves. We are haters of God. We are at enmity with God. We are we are conceived deserving uh, justice, the just wrath of God. We are conceived in sin, we read in scripture. We are conceived as seed of the serpent. And yet, simply because of God's sovereign, gracious choice, simply because of God's unconditional love and choice of us, he calls us. And he, like with Abraham, initiates that gospel call. So Isaiah chapter 51, verse 2 stresses this when it says, Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah who bore you, for he was but one when I, when I called him, that I might bless him and multiply him. There's nothing there about any goodness or merit by Abraham. By Abraham. No, he was just an individual man whom God set his electing love upon, his sovereign, gracious choice in calling him. And this is true uh, for both, really, both lines that come from Abraham, both the spiritual line who come to him by faith, and even the people of Israel themselves. This is emphasized over and over again uh, in the Old Testament, that Israel was not the, this chosen nation that would be the, 
as we talked about last last week, the guardians of the covenant promises and through whom God would accomplish redemption. That wasn't because they were some this this great nation. In fact, if you read the Old Testament and you get to the end, do you have this rosy picture of how wonderful the nation of Israel is? <laughs> right? Over and over again, uh, we see Abraham, we see Israel failing and sinning and being judged. And by the way, this is this is this is just a uh, a side note, uh, but it relates to uh, some of what we, we've talked about in the book of Genesis. That That is one evidence for the truthfulness of the Old Testament, <laughs> right? In all other history, historical accounts in, in ancient times, you know, when, when, when historians would record what happens in a particular nation or a particular kingdom, they would never record the bad stuff. They would only record that which makes the, especially the king, look good. And yet in the records we have of Israel, we have some good things. They do some good things. There's some positives. There's some blessings and benefits. But the majority of what is recorded in the nation of Israel is their rebellion, their sin, their syncretism, their, their idolatry, and particularly with the kings. I mean, think about the greatest king of Israel. And even his sin is not overlooked. So that's just a... A, a confirmation of the truthfulness of scripture. If this was all made up, they wouldn't, nobody would make it up this way, right? This is, this is what really happened. And of course, again, this is what's true of Abram. A Abraham individually was true of the nation of Israel as the nation through whom the Messiah was come is also true of us individually, we who believe, right? John three sixteen. God loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God didn't love the world because, because we are lovely, right? I love how the, uh, the what's that? Oh, yeah, that's expressed there. Yeah, what I was going to mention is I love how um, the Christian Standard Bible translates John 3.16. It translates it, for God loved the world in this way. That word so because sometimes when we read God so loved the world, it sounds like, ooh, he loved us so much because we're so lovable, you know? But that's not what the word so means. It just means this way. God, this way, loved the world. How did he love the world? By giving his son, by his free, sovereign, gracious love and grace that he bestowed upon those whom he had chosen simply to bring himself glory and simply to display his great love. And that's, that's true of us as well. Okay, so, so what is the nature of this faith? We're going to see in, in subsequent verses that Abraham does believe, and because of his belief, it is counted to him as righteous righteousness. And that is what is strongly emphasized in, in, the, um, in the New Testament. But just in reading verse 1, just in reading the call of God to Abraham, we can understand the nature of saving faith. God's call tells us the kind the kind of uh, faith that Abraham had, which justified him, which is again the same as us, the same as the faith that we need to have, um, because faith always has content, right? Which is not how a lot of people talk about faith today, right? Um, I just had faith. Well, you always have to ask when someone says that faith in what. Right? There's got to be content of the faith. Well, that 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 that's a person of faith you sometimes hear. You know, that, that politician, he's a, he's a man of faith. Well, what does that mean? We need to know the content of the faith, right? Which is exactly what we find here for Abraham, specifically, in, in these first verses of chapter 12. Um, so one way to think of it is, what is the content of our faith? Well, the content of the faith is belief in what God has said to us, what God has promised to us. And this is important because when it comes to the nature of God's revelation, we know that through history, God's revelation is unfolded in a progressive manner, right? Abraham didn't understand necessarily all that that would be entailed in the coming of Jesus and his perfect life and his sacrificial atonement on the cross and everything that happens. He didn't understand all of that, but he did understand the promise that was given in Genesis 3.15 that was handed down through those generations. He did understand the promises that God is going to make to him here in chapter 12. 
concerning the, the, the means of redemption in, a, in, in one who would accomplish that redemption. The, the important thing in terms of our faith is that we believe what has been promised to us. And of course, we now who have the full, complete canon of scripture, we have all the promises. We have no excuse. We have the revelation perfectly unfolded now for us. And so the same is true for us today, as was true of Abraham. We, what, is, what do we need to believe? We need to believe the promises of redemption that God has given to us. Do you think that the scout was uh, the Lord said to Abraham? Abraham heard a audible voice, or was it more like God revealing it to you? Yeah, I mean, of course, we can't know for sure, but I think we, there's a good reason to assume that it was an audible voice, right? Because you can't you you can't give clear content of biblical revelation without words, right? These are not impressions. You know, whether it was a dream in which God spoke or a vision, or was it an actual theophany, that we don't know. But clearly there are words, right? There are words given and articulated to Abraham, and that is the content of this faith. Yeah. So again, this is the same for us, right? We see this over and over again in the New Testament. You don't you don't find statements of the gospel articulated something like this. Just believe. Just believe, right? Believe and your faith will save you. No, it's believe in something, right? Acts 16, 31, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, right? John 5, 24, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life, right? So there are words that that, that must be the content of, uh, of saving faith. Acts 15, at the Jerusalem council, Peter stood and said, brothers, you know that in the early days, God made a choice among you that by the mouth of the Gentiles, but by my mouth, the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe, right? The Gentiles, the only way that they could be saved is that they heard the word, heard the content, and then therefore believed. And of course, this is what we see in Romans, right? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. And so if there's no one, if there's no content, if there's no preaching of the gospel, there is no salvation, right? So there's none of this. You know, there's a there's a native off there in the jungles of somewhere, and they just look at the at the stars, and they have faith in their heart, and so God saves them. No, there has to be a proclamation of the gospel, and so someone might say, "Well, then, well, then how can you know if they've never heard the gospel? How can they be saved?" Well, whom God has ordained and elected, He will send gospel messengers too, right? And but it's also a motivation for we who. Uh, are saved to clearly and, and boldly proclaim the gospel because people will not come without belief. So, so the first important element of faith that Abraham has, and that is true of all who believe, is believing in a certain content, and that content is the promises of the gospel given to us. But that's not all that, that there is to faith. Second, there's also a necessary commitment that is part of that saving faith. Uh, we see this with Abraham, Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, Abraham obeyed, right? How do we know he believed? He didn't just say, oh God, I believe. Now I'm going to go my merry way, right? Faith produces works of righteousness. Those works of righteousness are not the condition of salvation. They don't save us, but they are, they are the product of saving faith because saving faith involves obedience and commitment to doing what God has said we ought to do. And we're going to see this in Genesis 12, that after God gives Abraham this command to go out and the promises that come with it, Abraham obeys. And that is what uh, proves that he does have that, that saving faith. So there's belief in a content. There is a commitment then to follow the, the commands that are given. And then third, there is a change of identity that accompanies saving faith. We see this very literally with Abraham, right? He leaves his home. He leaves his family. He identifies now with Yahweh. And we've seen forevermore, Yahweh is identified with Abraham and Abraham with Yahweh. And he goes to uh, another land, uh, which sort of in, in a physical, very visible way signifies his change of identity. We today are not necessarily called as part of the gospel to, to leave, you know, our, our home and go to a different land. But are we not called to leave father and mother 
right? Isn't this what Jesus himself says? Whoever loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son and daughter more than me is not worthy of me. That's just Jesus's way of emphasizing this change of familial identity that accompanies saving faith, right? As, as believers, our ultimate identity should not be with our physical family members. Our ultimate identity ought to be with our, our, our spiritual family, those who believe. Now, this doesn't mean we don't love our family. It doesn't mean we don't provide for our family. The scriptures are clear, but there is a clear change of identity. Luke chapter 9, verse 23, and he said to all, if anyone who would, co would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever would lose his life for my sake will save it. So there's a change of identity that is part of and that accompanies saving faith. And then finally, clearly what that what all of that means, believing this content, I'm committing to obey it, and I'm changing my identity. That means that Abraham is going to leave his life of idolatry and sin, and he's going to follow after the true God, right? Uh, which is exactly, of course, what we see with Abraham when he leaves his home. It's not just leaving a physical place and going to another physical place. There is a, there is a change from following the sinful practices of idol worship, and now you know, offering up sacrifices of the one true and living God is a testimony of that faith and is a sign of allegiance to him. And of course, the same is true for us. We, you, can't, you can't say, I believe, but then still serve false gods, right? Belief, true saving faith, is not only an intellectual comprehension and assent to content, although it absolutely includes that, but there are a lot of people who intellectually assent to the content of the gospel who nevertheless don't truly have saving faith because they're not changing their identity. They're not changing their allegiance. They're not committing to follow after God. Uh, rather, they're just some saying, you know, saying, yeah, I believe that. And I'm going to go continue living on my very way. No, all of this is necessary for the, for the nature of saving faith. And all of this is seen very clearly uh, in the example of Abraham. But if all of that is embedded in faith, then the maybe the natural question might be, well, then, but is faith a work then? Right? If, if, if faith involves changing identity and committing to follow and leaving idolatry and, and, and serving the one true and living God, is faith a work? I mean, there seems to be sort of, uh, you know, works-like aspects to the nature, of, uh, the, the nature of saving faith. So what do we do with that? How do we answer that? Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2. So flash that out. It's a gift. Even faith is a gift, right? So yes, faith does involve commitment and it involves changing allegiance and involves actively believing a content and it involves, you know, uh, changing identity. It involves all of that. But that, but it's not a work. It's not a meritorious work because even that is a gift of God. Even that is a gracious gift. The fact that Abraham believes God, leaves his family, changes his identity, and goes to a place that he doesn't know. All of that is because God himself gave him that gift of faith. And of course, as, as, as we see in Ephesians chapter 2, that is the nature of our faith, so that no one can boast. Not even faith is something that we can boast about. That even is a gift of God. Without the gift of God in giving us, granting us that gift of faith, we would all still be lost in our sin, following after our own idolatrous sinful flesh, never seeking after God, you know, Psalm, uh, Psalm 14. But because God gives us faith, then we do receive the promises of God. And then finally, I think there's something important here about the, the, the nature of the very promise and the obedience that Abraham exhibits by faith. What is God asking him to do? We've already talked about that. Leave, leave your country, leave your kindred, leave your father's house. Okay, so there's this changing change of identity. And go where? And go to such and such a city in such and such a country, and there I've got, you know, a palace ready for you, right? And by the way, here are some pictures so that you know I'm not lying. <laughs> no, right? Go to a land that I will show you. I mean, that's like, you know, you're going you're gonna to really risk your entire livelihood. I mean, he's, he's, he's very clearly, we see in, in subsequent chapters, he's a wealthy man. This is a wealthy family. They've got a lot of possessions. He's going to leave all of that just for this like ambiguous to a place that I'm going to show you later, right? 
Uh, this is significant, and this is exactly, of course, what Hebrews 11 points out, that the, that the nature of saving faith is not believing in a content with commitment and change in identity and all of that, because we have some sort of empirical evidence and proof that God will keep his promises. No, what does Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, how does it define faith? Faith is a conviction of things hoped for, assurance of things not seen, which is so, you know, amazingly pictured in what happens with Abraham here, right? There's no empirical evidence. There's no, you know, other than the voice of God himself, he's got nothing to, to hang his hat on, which just shows you that this must be a miraculous work of God. Nobody's going nobody's gonna to just pick up and leave you know, without any evidence, except that God works in his heart to have a confident trust and commitment to the one who is making these promises. And of course, this is exactly true for us as well. And even, even the nature of what happens here is true of us. Because if you think about it, Abraham's obedience at this moment, which we'll see in, in, in upcoming verses, Abraham's obedience here makes him a pilgrim, a wanderer, a stranger, for the rest of his life. And is that not how the New Testament describes us? Right? This world is not ultimately our home. Ultimately, we have put our faith in the promises of God, longing for a better country. Not a country in which we have any pictures or physical empirical proof or evidence, but a country that is the the the, the very dwelling place of God Himself. That is our hope in a very similar way as Abram. Abraham. And, and, and again, the New Testament draws this out. Hebrews eleven thirteen. 13. These all died in faith, Abraham included, but the whole list. Notice this. Not having received the things promised. I mean, Abraham never actually fully experiences all of the promises that God is going to make to him, make to him here. But having seen them and greeted them from afar. How do they do that? Through eyes of faith. Right? That's the whole point of, of chapter 11. And having acknowledged, acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. And what, what, how does Peter describe us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11? Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles. Right? That's who we are as believers. We, like Abraham, our father, have put our faith in the promises of God with no empirical proof. We've committed, our, committed ourselves to him. We've been justified because of it. And ultimately, we look forward to that better country, the better home that has been promised to us. Luke 18, verse 29, and he said to them, truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. Right? So we, we're experiencing the blessings of salvation now, to be sure. Right, we, we have eternal life now, and we experience many of those blessings spiritually. But we have confidence that in the age to come, we will receive the full fulfillment of that, which is exactly how uh, he, Hebrews 11.16 says it. But as it is, they, that is all these people in faith, like us, desire a better country that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city, and that's the same heavenly country and same city that he's prepared for us. So all of these things really emphasize the significance for Abraham, not just as the father of the Jews, not just as the father you know, through whom the Messiah will come, although that's all true, but as the quintessential example of how we are saved and how we are justified and the hope that we have in the gospel of, uh, of an eternity in that heavenly city with the Lord. So we'll have a wonderful time for the next uh, many, many weeks of studying this man and all that comes through him. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for uh, this account of this man who is emphasized not because of his own merit, but because of your sovereign electing love given to him. And because of that, the representative example he is for us of justification by faith. Pray that you would enrich our own understanding of the nature of our salvation, our justification, and the nature of saving faith through studying this man, and that we would, uh, as we talked about a moment ago, be motivated to proclaim this same good news to those who have not heard, because without that proclamation of the content of saving faith, there can be no saving faith. So make that our lesson from this as well today, we pray. In Christ's name, amen.